What's going on with the Manchester United takeover? It's been over 12 months. Why are the Glazers stalling? We've been hearing stories about Qatar, Sheikh Yassin pulling out. We've been hearing stories about Sir Jim Ratcliffe going from 69, 51 to 25%. Welcome back to a brilliant episode of Football Economy with a special guest, Bilal Yogi. Stick around, we'll be back in 10 seconds to unpack everything. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to MUFC Realist TV, and I have a very honorable special guest joining us in the studio today. This is not a live recording. This is a pre-recorded message for you that's watching this right now. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, hit the notification button, but please welcome to the show. And welcome to the podcast, Mr. Bilal Yogi. How are you so today, sir? I'm very well, thank you, Mick. Thank you for having me on again. Very no, it's a pleasure. It. You had me on your channel. You did an interview. Now I'm just returning the favor. <laughs> thank you so much. Listen, Bilal, of course, it's Monday today. Uh, it's the day after. the uh, Everyone's talking about the Anfield agenda. You know, um, mm. of course, we're going to talk a little bit about that football because there's two fixtures on that uh, list that comes out when Premier League comes out. For me, as a Patriot Red, it is away at Anfield at Liverpool at home at a uh, you know Old Trafford, but um, we have you were a part of the podcast yesterday with the post match analysis. Let's start with this. Jurgen Klopp has been salty. There's been disrespect from certain Liverpool players, but at the end of the day, do you think it was an Eric Ten Hag masterclass to come to Anfield and to get a point? Um, yes, I do think it was uh, for a number of reasons. Number one being the amount of injuries Manchester United had. Number two, with the main player of Bruno Fernandes being out of the with the suspension, and number three, look how thin the bench was. And number four, mm. you, you Manchester United were the away team. It's down to the home team to take the game to Manchester United and and um, basically put them to the sword, which they couldn't do. I think what um, Eric Ten Hag did very well was there's a huge criticism of him at Ajax as well of this, where they used to say he does not have a plan B. And I think yesterday he showed his tactical adaptation of how he can change mm. and how he can um, adapt to uh, the card that is dealt to him. So I thought it was a very good performance, but they need to build on it. There's no point going and losing to West Ham on Saturday and then you're back to square True. one again. True. You mentioned something very interesting. You mentioned about plans, plan A and plan B, and you said there's no plan. But of course, in this podcast, we're going to talk about the sales takeover, the glazes. What is the plan A? What is the plan B? And where are we at this moment, guys? Be before we continue, tell the audience who you are, what you do, and what is the platform? Uh, very much welcome to sure. you know promote yourself. So, so guys, I am for anyone that's not come across my work. So, my name is Bilal Jogi. I am the founder of the Football Economy podcast, where we kind of cover and take care of everything to do with football and business related issues, stories, and we kind of break them down into very simple terms for everyone to understand. We've covered all the big teams like Everton, who are going through a takeover at the moment, but most of our work in the last 12 months has been around Manchester United and um, covering this takeover that me and Mick are about to go into right now. Yeah, we are. We are definitely we're definitely going to go into it. So pleasure to have you on the channel. So let's kick off this podcast. Uh, we, we're just going to ease into the, the final crescendo of the topic today. And of course, that you see the thumbnail, Glazes are stalling. And we're going to come to a theory. Just for the reference, for a disclaimer, we are not the news. Uh, we just you know, analyze, we report on the news, and we are putting our critical minds together, applying logic and reasoning. We present you one side of the story, the second side of the story at the balance. At the end of the day, how you receive it, that is your truth. That has always been this channel agenda. Bilal, I want to talk to you about the economical impact for Manchester United being out mm. of Europe. We all seen it. We got knocked out from the Champions League. We didn't even qualify from Europe. That means that affects Manchester United's economy. Reportedly, 
we think it's a loss of 75 million in revenue and forecast. Now, my question to you, how is this affecting Manchester United moving forward? And will this force the Glazers' hand to sell quicker? Um, I think this is a big problem for Manchester United, who are, who are if you look over their accounts since COVID, are uh, eating into their cash reserves. So for anyone listening, cash reserves is the cash you have in the bank for day-to-day -day running, helps with the cash flow. And I think before COVID, it was like 200 million, something like that. It was, it was a, And it's down to like 50, 60, or 70. And this forecast, they would have, with the outlay they did in the summer, they would have, in my estimation, hope to have got to at least the quarterfinals. They had a great group to get out of as well. Um, mm. So it impacts them quite heavily financially. Secondly, they've also maxed out on their credit facility, which they had. Um, and thirdly, their loans are up for renewal pretty soon. I think end of next year, if I'm not yes. there's a loan recall, I'm pretty sure. So this will affect them because if based on being out of the Champions League, based on them currently being eighth in the league, and let's just say for argument's sake, they finish eighth, they're going to be in some serious trouble. Now, coming to your second part of the question is, does it, if this situation would have arised last season, Mick, and we would have been in the same situation, let's say February, March, where we are now, I think United would have been sold to the Qatari group very, very quickly at that mm. point, because I think it would have been a clean break. What didn't work for the Qatari group was that United were performing very well on the field, which mm. gave Glazers time to breathe and assess their op options. Yes, but that's now logical. You're in a, that is, now you're in a situation where they are, the screws Backs are against the wall. tighter. Yeah. 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 I think you can say in that in layman's term, like if I may play the devil's advocate to sort of translate a little bit what you're saying, for people that don't really understand financial terms, it is pretty much you kick the can as far as you could, you hope for the best, but now your back is against the wall. If you look at the current financial state, I mean, what you spoke about, maxing out the credit cards, because basically... Glaze has been taking loan dividends and the transfer market have been using capitalizing, using a credit card. Last thing that I saw on the last financial report, we utilize Santander Bank 300 million euros in just for the transfer market. So basically, Glaze has stopped taking dividends. It's been voted down like, you know, back in January already by the board, a vote of no confidence, pretty much, by my understanding. Now, this season around, it's just been a gravy train of how do I say? We don't have any more money. Banks don't want to give any more. The main credit holder here is Bank of America that holds the bond, right? And Correct. they have said, we want you to repay this debt by the end of next year. So my question to you, if some miraculous reason, which is an idiotic reason, because Glazers needs to sell. Like from <clears throat> me and you, we follow in the finance. We follow the money. We don't follow what the media is saying 100%, right? If, this is my take on it, and I want to hear your opinion. If the Glazers decide to stay in the current state, do you think that they are steering this ship to an administration? Mick, they can't stay in the current state because they haven't got money to operate at the current state. So that is just pretty straightforward, right? Mm. So what, what, what the situation is, is that they're running out of cash and they're running out of revenue. So even if we take the league cup as an example which we've been knocked out of they would that's an impact on revenue as well because if you have home games you, you sell tickets the champions league if they got the fa cup in january so it's mm. not looking very good and the, th the the other thing the problem is the premier league is getting harder and harder to compete in so you can yes. see aston villa this season who are now competing so it's not a, it's not like before where you had two three teams and you could kind of know where you were going to be. If you have a bad season like Chelsea, you could be totally out of Europe, mm. which could impact you. And it's impacting Chelsea, who, who nearly spent a billion. So in other words, so, cash is liquidity, cash is king. If you don't have cash in the bank, you're screwed. A lot of people say you can refinance, you can refinance, but I think they've been refining, uh, refinancing. Um, this is the last straw, what they've been doing, right? There's no more money you, to be taken. You can refinance. Um, if you wanted, for, as an example, just to keep it simple, but the interest rates are really high at the moment. Yes, um, they are. 
So the, the, the worldwide interest rates, if you have a look at them and the base rates are really high and they're not going to come down to what they were before mm. COVID in the next year or two. You know, they so might COVID, help, but the interest rates... Yeah, so COVID plays a major major impact and plus the current financial world global economic crisis, which is a credit crisis. Banks, I'm all wary, banks is not going to lend up. We saw when they came out for a strategical review you had minority investment firms and banks looking to invest, but everyone pulled out, right, for some reason. And this has been one spin after the other, 25%. They, they were looking for a 25% investment, but nobody wanted to invest. And this is, has to do, according to my opinion, I'm asking you, is it due to the high interest rates at the current market rate and the, uh, the global financial crisis that we are experiencing? Is this pretty much dissimilar, like 2008 crisis or even worse? Yeah, it's a lot worse. And just to come on your point, uh, Mick, regarding uh, minority investors, if you look at um, um, what happened with AC Milan when the American capitalist firm came in as a minority investor, they have very, very strict goals and um, stipulations that they have that if this isn't where their actual aim is to do a hostile takeover of mm. the club or the company and take it over and sell it on. So I think the minority investment into Manchester United was never an option. And one thing I would like to put out there is it won't be a popular opinion, but the facts are facts where the Glazers are, from a business point of view, not stupid operators, where people might think they don't know about football. They're not stupid people, you know. They are, a, the, you, you, could say, you can park that uh, train of thought. Uh, they're not stupid operators. But I would say that if you're a billionaire, you supply yourself with people that advise you. That will give you the advice, you know, financial advice and stuff like that. So they could be still a little bit like, you know, naive, but they, you surround yourself with people that give you advice. And you could say that they were never in charge of Manchester United on the front foot. They were always sitting in the back room, appointing the people to run the business for them, like, you know, Edward Wood and Matt George, which failed, right? So yeah, it was, for them was an investment, yeah. But they were it still involved in the financial decision to say, we approve this, we approve that, we approve this transfer, right? We approve this transfer, we want this sponsorship, we want to increase this revenue, we want to do this, we want to do that. Um, so so when it comes to, from a business point of view, a minority investment from their point of view would never, was not possible. I think they've always wanted some sort of sale or, 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 or an investment into the club hmm. where they can have some sort of control or they can sell out at a really high 5x, 10x value. But this is nothing new. Like, you know, they went to, I think it was Arias. They, they, they went and asked for a minority investor and they looked at it and they said, no, that was like two, three years ago. So that minority that investor right, yeah. has always been there for them to buy out the, this, the remaining siblings, right? So this is kind of correlating, relating. It's the same sort of recycle news, but now they're putting it on Ineos, 25%. Um, so, okay, we have unpack that a little bit to to sort of explain the reason you know why the glazers need to sell right because a lot of people have fear they say glazers will never leave but finances according to me they don't lie you know if you look at the american investment with the buccaneers <clears throat> the same business model has been applied to the buccaneers credit 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 right so bilal just to summarize this first question though um to knit it together Basically, you kick the, the can as far as you can. Your back is against the wall. The credit crisis is there. You have no cash. You have no liquidity. The balance scorecard books, if you look at it, you know, the debt is higher than the profit revenue, right? And the FFP comes in and look at it. And basically, Manchester United is screwed if we don't fix this, right? There needs to be balanced. Yeah, absolutely. It needs to be balanced. And um, like you've said, just to summarize this whole um, section into uh, s simplify it, the Glazers are running out of cash. They are not in a position to kick it any further down the road. They cannot refinance. Well, in an, they will, it'll be very difficult for them to refinance based on the interest rates that are in the world, world of finance currently and, and will be for the next two years. So the only way for them to grow this club and even get it punching to where it needs to be is whether either they put some money in, which they've never done, or somebody else mm. comes and puts money in, which I'm sure we'll touch upon now. 
interesting or another option and this is the um i would say that surprise moment of this podcast of this show that it's been sneaking under the radar that i that we want to discuss to you fans and uh, whoever's tuning in and this is pretty much why are the glazes stalling why hasn't the sales takeover been taking place we've seen a hundred percent takeover bid from sheikh yasim nadi to holding foundation we've seen sir jim ratcliffe restructuring his deal from 69 51 to 25 percent but there's no decision media has been talking imminent here we go it's happening on monday it's happening on tuesday it's happening friday next week uh, next year or perhaps never um so <laughs> It's, it's always come down to the boiling point that I want to bring to the stage below. And this is the, the one, the one that's brooming here in the background because there is a decision imminent on the new 80 club European Super League that will scrap the Champions League. This is a proposal that's been sneaking in the background, Bilal. And this is the ruling that's going to take place this week. Could this be? what the glaze has been waiting for could this be why they haven't sold to anyone as of yet because barring that you did describe the current financial situations barring that they always been lusting for this super league <coughs> do you think that they've been hanging on for this final verdict that's taking place this week in order to make a decision mick yeah you know um when you sent me this last night and i had a read of it you are totally correct when you're saying that this has gone under the radar could this be a, a tactic to um, keep them here for longer and open their revenue streams up yes it could be it could be but i don't think it will be because for example let's say on thursday they're allowed to start this new at team mm. super league um i'm assuming um that uefa will appeal it try taking it to court there'll be a lot of legal um processes to go through which would probably delay it. Um, it won't yes. be as straightforward as on Thursday, there's a new AT team Super League, and next season, this starts. Even if it was to start, it's not going to be next year. It might be in two years' time. Yes. Because it has yes. to go through a process. And the same thing comes with the shirt sponsorship with Adidas. That doesn't really kick in until 2025. So the money doesn't really apply until then. And the same principle mm. with the new Europa Super League. Let's just revamp the story here. I'm just going to read it out. Absolutely. I'm not going to display Absolutely. it on the screen. As a revamped idea of the failed Europa Super League plot is being led by sports development company A22 Sports and will be heard in a court this week as the bid to get the project off the ground. A new proposal to establish European Super League faces D-Day in the court this week. 15 judges at the European Court of Justice are set to rule on an attempt to smash UEFA's jurisdiction over European game on Thursday. We're talking about this Thursday. And this time, the plan is to ask up 80 of the content, content, continent's top clubs to join the revolution. And the clubs they are talking about, right? This is uh, this is very interesting. You know, it's the nightmare before Christmas, according to what this article is saying for the Premier League, La Liga, and everyone else. And and pretty much it contains Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester City, Manchester United, Spurs. It, it is what it is, but they are not giving away. And the ones that are leading this, do you know who that is? This pushing on this. It is basically Real Madrid's president. That's right. Yes. What's his? Yeah, and Florentino Perez. Perez, Florentino Perez, and Bartomeu, isn't it? Bartomeu from Barcelona, and basically, <clears throat> I'd to say that Champions League, it's kind of changing its format, right? It's been there for quite a while, but Premier League is kind of the Super League of Europe at the moment. This is where the revenue is. This is where the best team is. This is where TV money is. And this is where the best players and coaches are at the moment right now. It's a very competitive league. On the other hand, you look at Serie A, La Liga. It's dying. It's kind of dying in TV sponsorships. It's not as exciting. And they are kind of a little bit broke at the moment. If you look at the financial situation, they didn't really survive COVID properly, if we may say so. So they're the ones been pushing for it, you know, in my opinion. And they haven't really given away. So I, I see that this ruling... 
I, I, I don't really know the law, but by everyone that signed the contract are still obliged to follow through, by my understanding. So they cannot really get away with it. We're talking about Manchester United and everyone else. Yeah, and I think what they've done with this is they've um, one thing that was missed upon the last Super League, a great point was um, the Premier League team, all the teams were not looking to break away from their current mm. uh, local league, their own, own leagues. It was just to replace the Champions League. And here, where it will get very interesting is, for example, one, will this format have a relegation and promotion? Because the last Super League did not have that. It was a set of teams that stayed in this league. Um, and secondly, if it is approved on Thursday, how UEFA, who have you know a lot of financial power, how do they combat this and how do they try to mm. stop this, which will then prolong it, in my opinion? 100%. I mean, it's basically for continue reading this article without displaying it on the screen. If you can listen, A22 is the, the organization that wants to take away the URI. UEFA's authority to punish club from competing in rival tournaments. So this is basically their rival tournaments, right? And mm -hmm. if the judgment goes their way, it's likely to be remembered as the watershed moment of the game. But they remember, they don't ask the people, <clears throat> what does the people want? Football is a, you know, consumer's game, right? Do we really want that? Right? Absolutely. I'm just going to use an example, Mick, um, for the listeners as an alternative sport. In cricket, the biggest uh, franchise league is the IPL, which takes place in mm. India. And once the IPL started, there was an attempt to create a few breakaway leagues at that time. I'm going back nearly 10, 12 years ago. These leagues never really succeeded because what happened was um, governing bodies put bans on players. Television brought... It, it started to get really messy. It went mm. to court and eventually... The smaller leagues, the, the breakaway leagues, died out. And like you said, number two, is there an appetite from fans for a new league? The Champions League has a lot of heritage. It has a lot of mm. history. It has a lot of iconic moments. People like the format. They like the music. It means a lot on a Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday when the games happen. Is there an appetite for fans for a new European Super League? Mm. Well, the Premier League latest deal is about worth about 6.7 billion right and we, we see that it's going to change next uh, next um next season just yeah. to sort of revolve a little bit but if this comes through the what a22 is pushing i mean we're looking at massive massive increase we, we're talking about mega mega bucks here right we're talking about over 6.7 billion and you're talking about TV rights to Sky News, BT, and they're going to outbid each other. You're going to start in introducing the body cams, the three, you know, the, the goggle glasses, what they people, the three, what do you call it? These VR glasses, what people have been promoting. Yeah. Uh, the this, headsets. The headsets. And this, for me, is now tying back into every this technology and pieces, tying in back into this one. This is the moment what people have been forgetting about. We, 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 we were hit by this. Europa Super League, and we were protesting, but it's not going away. Apparently, it's back here. It's going to be ruled, but 80 club European Super League. And I believe that this is kind of a little bit what the Glaze has been waiting for. Yeah, absolutely. It, because the money is more, right? It brings in more revenue. And, 100%. Uh, this will save. Is a big pull. Yeah, this is a lifeline saver for Real Madrid. This is a lifeline saver for the, the broke clubs. I, mean, I might say that. Definitely Barcelona is in financial tatters as well. Uh, Manchester United is on a brink for going towards administration. If we don't sell, we need to sell. And I see this as just being a poker game on the Glazers side, right? But the, the hand has been shown. The hand has been shown, right? So yeah, can we make a sort of argument here without, without being speculative or we are being sensationalist? Like, you know, why has this going under the radar? Why is nobody talking about it? We are now sitting here talking about right now as a hypothetical theory why the Glazers are holding on. I think um, just regarding the Glazers and why this could be a poker game, I think the reporting on the whole takeover has been really poor um, and really um, unbalanced and it's been reported mostly by football journalists hmm. who are reporting this like a transfer. For example, 
final negotiations. This yes. one day we're going to get, you know, and this yep. isn't really like that. It's, it's more. It's just a matter of fact, not when it's about. No, what, what did you say? It's not a matter of fact of it's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen. When it's. Yeah. No, I, I kept forgetting uh, the terminology. Yeah. It, it, the, if it's going to happen, is when is it going to happen? And um, the thing is, it's going to happen. Um, if if I explain this to, for your viewers based in the UK who will have it, when you buy a property, um, it goes through a legal process with your lawyer and you're going to assess mm. the building, you'll assess so many things, things go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and that's what is happening. But and where, the, where the whole thing has got out of control is, is how it's been reported. So, for example, a lot of aggregator accounts will say, this Monday, Jim Radcliffe takes over, mm. and then the other counts pick that up and start saying yes. This Monday, but it can't. Yeah, it, it can't. It can't be Monday because of it's a PLC. It's the way it has to be reported. It, it's the way it has to be put Brilliant. across. Um, secondly, just I, I, I've, I have on our own podcast followed this so intensely, and um, bar one or two journalists, most journalists are so lazy in the reporting that they've not even done their own research on. The how the process actually works. works. So people are really ill-informed and then fans get their hopes up and when it doesn't happen, but, they get upset and there's a backlash. And they get this blue tick called by credible journalists as well. So a lot of fans, a lot of people, a lot of readers, if you control the information, you control people's behavior. And a lot of people say, no, no, I don't believe it. You know, I, it, This comes from Mike Keegan's, this comes from Ben Jacobs, this comes from Ornstein, because they're seen in the public as credible journalists. But what you said, they're sports journalists. You know, they're not business experts, right? Um, so that's kind of leads into my question. I mean, you know that I've been talking a lot about this media's role in this takeover them confuses the fans and you know i like to call it out for for a spade a spade because at the end of the day they have editorials they have to sell newspapers they have to put food on the table for their families but what they don't what what they're not are is manchester united fans and they don't really care what they put out there there's no responsibility or accountability so why do you think they've been driving this agenda uh, purely for clicks and purely for hitting targets. It's just mm. really pretty straightforward as that. And the, most journalists that are covering this, that are writing about this, are, are basically quoting each other. So Talk Sport will quote the Sun, the Sun will quote mm. Talk Sport. Um, Dominance. Vice versa. Then, yeah, and then the aggregator accounts pick it up. The, the, the average fan on this uh, does not understand how this works. So then think, yeah, Monday it is, Glazers have gone. Monday comes and nothing happens, and it's just yes. a circle that keeps yes. going round. But there's certain process that needs <laughs> Mick, to take Can I just come into this one second? Sorry, there's also led just just so the, the the fan can understand this. Everton are going through a similar process right now with Triple Seven and Capital, mm. where they're going through a takeover. Look at the coverage on the Everton takeover, and look at the coverage of the Manchester United takeover, and 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 it's. I didn't Similar even know process. there was a takeover there with Everton. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> exactly. uh, Everton are going through one right now. It's it, it actually um, it's at the Premier League stage where um, it's very advanced. Um, they could actually go bust if this does not go through. They're in big, big trouble, and no one's met, no one's covering that uh, as much. Um, I speak hmm. to so many um, YouTube channels that cover Everton for our own podcast, and we've been talking about this on our own podcast since the summer. But excellent, if you look excellent. at the comparison of coverage like you said most people don't even know everton are going through this and that's because manchester united drive awareness clicks coverage and it helps yes. the journalists hit their targets excellent that you mentioned that because you know i've been doing this over 200 podcasts you know providing nuance balanced right because it has to be balanced right and for me, it's always been 100% 100% full sales takeover. You know, I cannot lie. I, I am 100% takeover. For me, it's been far enough. Glazers has been here for 18 years. We haven't gone anywhere with Glazers. Right? So they need to go. And if you think that 25% is going to solve anything, and that's my next question to you. Do you see, I mean, you understand finance, and I, I, some people don't. And the thing is, they think that, oh, well, it's called divide and conquer, right? 
again, it's called divide and conquer. They try to spin the story that 25% will be all right, right? But you keep forgetting that who is still in the backseat? It's the Glazers. Cool. Bilal, 25%. Is that going to solve the prob problems of the club's finances? Or will the 25% just pay off the Glazers? A 25% only sale does not resolve anything whatsoever. We're still Let going down the Let me just clarify this. A, 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 phased, a, a phased buyout does solve the issue. Number two. So these are two separate things that I'm going to touch upon. So if the Glazers say we're only selling 25% and that is it, I agree 100% with what you said, mate. It resolves nothing. It, it puts you back to, you'll be in the same situation in a year's time where you need to raise more money and it doesn't really uh, make any difference. But this 25%, does that tie in to the result of the ruling of the Super League? It makes sense then if you connect your logic to say, ah, well, depends on the verdict. Maybe we can take this face buyer. Maybe we can take this uh, Jim Ratcliffe's uh, 25% and with this extra cash, then we can gradually phase out. That could be a plausible solution. But right here, right now, is what we said. If this Super League is happening, it's not going to happen until next year, two years in planning, right? So that's 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 just a smokescreen, according to my opinion, though. So 25% will not solve it. If we continue this rate, because there's, there's certain information, what I gather that, you know, he's a minority investor, like, you know, and why, why didn't the Glazers go for a minority investor with all these... Uh, investment firms that came in and had a look under the hood when it was a review, right? So it comes down to something that I want to bring to the station, something that I've been talking about at the end of the day, Bilal, because you know me. I've been doing this with a critical eye. I criticize the media. I look at it from the both sides of the story. I have my network, but the thing is so toxic within this fan base to even tweet about it, to even talk about it, because you get shut down. Some people call you ITK. Some people call you shut up, this, that, and that. But at the end of the day, every single journalist in this case is an ITK in the know because they, they've they been pulling information from somebody in the scouting department in Manchester United it has nothing to do with the sales takeover rather than speaking to the people that are in this deal, right? We're talking about Ineos. And Ineos, on the other hand, has been appointed their external PR team to handle all this PR. Now, Bilal, I did a piece on this in May. I did a podcast on this in May. And I've been saying this all along. I want to bring this to the table because I was not the only one. This was also reported by Jack Otway from The Express. Right? I want to bring this to the stage because he said that Manchester United takeover Sir Jim Ratcliffe could be a smokescreen in Jessim's boost. And there's always been a feeling that Otway, Otway wrote this May 12th, May 12th. I will post this article in the video description as well, so you can go and check it out for yourself. But it's always been a sense that there has only been one bidder in the process. You know, Rain Group was there to design this shadow bidding process to get those high roller, you know, oil shakes into the bid. Because if you look at it, the evaluation of the club, according to Forbes, is only 4.8 billion. This whole blind takeover poker game has been just to get this oil rich state countries to put a bid in. So they attracted them, right? So mm. 92 Holding Foundations kind of felt a feeling, according to this article as well, hey, we are bidding against ourselves, right? And they always felt, believed that Sir Jim Ratcliffe was kind of a smokescreen or a prop to sort of to use that against them. But at the same time, since you have your own PR team and consultancy that is leaking information constantly to the press, every day, every week, we hear something, Ineos, this, Ineos, that. Yeah, Ineos uh, will sack, uh, will appoint this guy, he will sack this guy. But you can't do that if you don't have the keys as of yet, right? So it's all media-driven, right? But what benefits are you actually getting from being attached to this PR coup? Nobody really knew who Ineos was a year ago until this came to light that we're bidding, you know. Nobody really understood who Sir Jim Ratcliffe was until he came into the light. And nobody really understands 
why he's gone from 69 to 51 to 25. So for me, I put my two and two together. I go back into my archive. I go back to my articles and I say, well, maybe this is something. Maybe it is a smoke screen. Can we say a prop, right? Because the whole shadow process is to get as much money for the glazes that are currently broke. So this 25% does not make any sense to me if you look at the finances, right? Of course, if it's a faced buyout, fine. If this Europa League comes through tuition, that's fine. But currently, it's not. Do you believe that this could be something in what Jack is saying and what I'm thinking as well? Because the media has been driving this agenda. Like, you know, they've been, there's one story that's leaking out and it's apparently coming from the Ineos side. Like, oh, they're coming to join on the work on Monday. They're coming. But from a business perspective, it does not work like this. You have to still pass the director's fitness test. There's transactions that needs to be made. You have to sh show to the board, to the Premier League board, that you have no involvement in other business sports operation. And by the way, you cannot take a club on debt. <clears throat> if we look at it in a black and white point of view, you are hundred percent right. Okay. Yeah, this this um, what I think has happened, in my opinion, is Sheikh Jassim has left his bid on the table because mm -hmm. he feels that he's bidding against himself because nobody else is bidding a hundred percent for the club at the moment, right? So he's like, I'm going to give you. We'll give a number six billion dollars we'll call it dollars because it's in the new york stock exchange so we'll do it for dollars six billion dollars take it or leave it it's there so he doesn't yeah. feel he needs to raise his bid because no one else That's is it. giving six billion dollars right now right on the flip side <clears throat> i think what and where credit has to be given because i mentioned this a few times on my podcast and i couldn't understand this at the time i was like i don't understand why jim ratcliffe is it how Jim Clark Ratcliffe is going to compete with the Qataris because he hasn't got the he will finances? Never. No, he, right? he knew he but knew he could he not did, compete as soon as Qatari he entered. Compete. He could he, not compete. He could not compete. So therefore, but what he the did. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mick. What he did do really well was he stayed in the race, and what he did was why did he, he kept, stay in the race? Because I think he wants he wants to purchase the club. If he wants to purchase any other. Premier League club. That's He made it very clear if you go back to his interviews. But the question is, you've got to ask the hard, practical business sense PR branding question, which I do. I come from that world as well. You know, Why would you stay in the bid and why would you make yourself relevant and constantly leaking out information to the press? And this is tying in together because this is positive free PR. That's what it is. This doesn't mean that you are actually taking it. doesn't mean that it is advanced. That's the thing. I have spoken to numerous people. I'm not going to mention my sources, my names, but they're saying they're getting information from the INEOS PR camp and some you know, intermediate solicitors. That's what they're getting the information from. Now, you can argue to the point they haven't signed an NDA, but you can make up stories left, right, center to spin the, the advantage to you. That's the thing, right? Agents do that all the time in the transfer windows. They utilize media to spin the positive story about their client, right? To create general interest, you know, to boost up the valuation of the, the sales price of a X player that are representing. So I'm just putting my logical hat on. You know, I'm not saying this is the news. This is not, this is the way I see it from my, you know, Mick Ruby's world, right? You could make, you, there's no reason why you cannot be right. Yeah, this potentially could be exactly what you're saying as well. The what works in your favor is that the delay of this being announced. And if you remember correctly, I think it was September when it was reported reported by James Ducker. I think it was that Ineos have, have um, in um, Ineos are going to take a, a stake in Manchester United, and the meeting is this coming Thursday. Mm -hmm. And what he did was. He pieced two things together. Um, what he said was the, the meeting was happening anyway on that Thursday because they've mm -hmm. been scheduled already, the shareholder meeting. And he just mm -hmm. said, right, it's, this 25% is happening, which and there's a meeting being set for it, which hadn't. And as you can see now, this has been going on for so long. But in my honest opinion, I think 
it's not over until it's over. I'm not saying Gattari's are going to win. I'm not saying Jim Ratcliffe's going to win. I'm just saying until it's announced, we don't really know which direction this is going That's in. It. That's it. I have my own inkling. I have my own views on it. But from a black and white point of view, we don't know which direction this is. They could pull the whole plug on the whole thing. They could. And I always keep my powder dry knowing what I know. I'm not I'm not going to be suicidal to Gamay because so many people said something reaffirmed and I was shut down. You know, I'm I'm brave, but I'm not suicidal. That's the thing, right? But according to my opinion and my analysis and the people that have been speaking to this race is far from over. And I always say to people, it ain't over to the fat lady sings. And that's opera, right? What we're trying to do here from an educational purpose to give you an eye opener, right? This is not news. This is us giving you bits and pieces, clues and everything. And the way you can interpret it, you know, use your logic, sense and reasoning and to understand why is it the way it is? Why is it being treated like a transfer window? You know, Fabrizio Romano comes in and do a tap in, like, you know, to say it's going to happen. Um, personal terms, not a problem. Here we go. Because everyone that wants to be attached to this story gets to win the Pulitzer Prize, whoever breaks it. And that's it. It's called self entitlement. Guys, this might be a mad theory, but I think we're on to something below here because I don't understand why people are not reporting on the Super League. And that ruling is taking place on this I think, Thursday. Mick, the Super League, I think the Super League, the problem with that was, I think the timing of the article wasn't very good. Mm. Um, it went a bit under the radar because of the big, if it was reported on, let's say, today or tomorrow, it probably would have had more impact because of the huge fixtures over the weekend. It just kind of went under the radar a little bit. Mm. Final question, though, before we wrap up. Do you see this far from over? Do you see that? There might be a chance for a final crescendo. We, we're talking about PR, right? You, you, you mentioned it before. Um, 92 Holding Foundation, they felt like they are the only ones that this has been reported. Maybe it's a PR trick from their side as well to say we are out. They may, it didn't say out. It means we're out of the bidding process. We have put our final bid on the table, take it or leave it. We know, Glazes, that you need to sell. We know that you are broke. You know that this is our table. Good luck with that. Here, we're, here we go, right? And the the whole thing has been called financial review. So basically, all the bidders are waiting for the feedback. It's not an announcement. It's nothing. You know, if you if you read the sales process over takeover process carefully, everyone is waiting for feedback at the moment. So basically, get glazes are waiting. I think, I think the glazes are waiting for the final verdict on Thursday to give feedback. I think this is an icebreaker. Bilal, call me crazy, but let's see. <laughs> We'll find out on Thursday. Yeah. But do you personally believe that Sheikh Yassim is out? Or do you think he's just looming there in the background that, that you said his bid is on the table? It's a card game. It's a billionaire squid game. Who blinks first? I think this is just my opinion. Look, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I think sure. opinion. He, they quickly realized they were bidding against themselves and they had a set number that they were willing to go at, which was, we'll call it the $6 billion. They've left it on the table. And, and I think that is it. I think, in my opinion, I think what will happen is Manchester United will eventually Jim Radcliffe which will be sold. I think that's my opinion. I think it'll be a phased buyout. And I think the reason it's taking a very long time is because of certain goals, certain situations, certain scenarios. For example, if Manchester United finish in the top four and we wanna we wanna sell out next year what will the cost be if manchester united get relegated what will happen if manchester united have x y if the super league mm. happens what will the value be i think that's where it's at and i think that's where it's at i think i that's think so too i think so too i think so too i agree Most. with your point i think 25 percent will not do anything whatsoever but i think if it's 25 percent now 35 percent next year over that period that could work but I think the, the most important thing that fans need to understand is is stop li spending time on Twitter and saying when, sure. when somebody with zero credibility is saying on Monday he starts work, when legally, like Mick has said, he cannot start work until he goes through a full process, which will take about then. six to True eight then. weeks. Nothing's uh, He's not going to come in next week and then Manchester United are going to have a mm. big January window. This is going to be a very long-winded process. Whoever comes in, whether it's Sheikh Jassim, even if he comes in tomorrow, 
There's a long-winded process that you have to go through. And regarding another stumbling block, which Mick, I'll just touch upon for for, sure. for Ratcliffe's side might be how they deal with um, his French club. I think it's Nice, is it? It's Nice, nice isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And the Champions League issue. But I'm pretty sure it, it, City have got a similar problem because their Spanish club, I forgot the name of it now, the one that's at the Genoa, I think it's called mm. Genoa, or the top of La Liga. If they end up in the Champions League and City end up in City, have got an also similar problem. But mm. it's best to wait and see what happens and whichever direction it goes in. Let's hope we all get 100% buyout because I, I'm that's on my it. Team as well. And we yep. get somebody in charge that can actually run the club and put it in a position where we can compete and not be in a situation where we are just playing catch up every summer. True then. Bilal, I think we're running out of time, but just want to summarize and just want to give you fans that are watching or viewers that's watching, you know, my personal standpoint, this is my opinion, only my opinion, and I stand by my opinion. I don't believe in a 25% it's going to do anything. I'm always been glazes out 100% full sell only. If it's a face buyout, let's say if it's a Sir Jim Ratcliffe that will get it, I will criticize it, you know, because I want to know, and I think the fans want to know, what is the roadmap from here? Is it a guarantee that you will take over <clears throat> within three years? We want to know. But right now, we don't know, you know. All we know right now is that it's been one year in the making of this sales takeover, and it's a normal process. It takes about one to 18 months to sell this magnitude of a, of a business transaction. It is a business tra transaction. It's not a transfer transaction, just to make it sure. But as Bob, you said, Bilal, um, financially speaking, I think we are coming to a very close crescendo. I don't think it will be, um, as what you said, they're not going to come in and operate as of January. There might be announcement in January or it might be something, but we are two weeks away. And what you said, what matters is that we as a club turn the page that we as a club get that financial support that we need barring that our footballing operation generates enough money for us to be sustainable we know that but we need that little bit of a sugar coating daddy to come in and help us because we've been rotten in that um, stadium and the training ground xyz Mate, it's been a I lot of Mm. Can I just add into that? I think just two points before you wrap up. The first one is I don't believe uh, Ratcliffe is stupid enough just to buy 25% and just let it be. No. He's never bought a minority investment. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't believe be. he's stupid enough just to give his no, money it, away to the Glazers. Here you go. It's a, it's a loan. It's a PR, it's a PR spin. It's a, P, it's a PR disaster to buy 25% and be it in is. bed with the Glazers. Number two is that I feel eventually he has if it, i'm just using ratcliffe as an example here if he is mm -hmm. to purchase the club at 25 percent if it doesn't have a roadmap to a, a majority investment of 69 or 100 percent it's it's a pointless exercise whatsoever and i think it is and the third point i want to add in is that there's a fascination around fans to have a middle eastern owner if you look at chelsea who never had a middle eastern owner and one of the most successful clubs in the Premier League over the last 20 years, it's about having the right owner. It's not about having uh, a, a right Correct. owner can come from can, can come from Australia. It can come from the US. It's Anywhere, about yeah. having the right owner. right owner. So we need to stop having this fascination that it needs to be Middle Eastern. The right owner that English. loves the club. It was Obravich, Chelsea. He was a dream owner. He loved the club. He, he wanted to win. He was a mad football fan and. Unfortunately, we know what the story was, 100%. But right owner that loves the club, up, that wants Jim, to invest, that remember, wants to make us successful, and that's what we want to do. Mick, if you remember Blackburn, in uh, when they won the Premier League, they were owned by Jack Walker. You know, he mm. was a local fan. He was a, he was a Blackburn boy, a local fan, and his and he competed with Manchester United, took a very small club, Blackburn mm. are probably the size of Wigan as a football club, and got him to win the Premier League. So... It's not about having a Middle Eastern owner who can we can we want an owner that does the best for the club, whether wherever mm. he is from. Fantastic! I think we're running out of time. It's been fifty minutes. It's been sure uh, total football, total economy talk, talking sense, logic, and reasoning, guys. But we want to hear from you guys that's watching in. Leave your comments in the comments section. 
Do you agree what we are saying? Do you have another theory, another opinion? Please leave your comment in the comment section below. And don't forget to like and subscribe to this video. And also go and check out Bilal and his podcast and his channel. Bilal, once again, where can people find you just for the reference? I will leave the the, the description, uh, the all the details in the video description as, as well. But final word from Bilal as well. Big up. Yeah, uh, firstly, thank you for once again for having me, Mick. And guys, you can find us across all social media. Just type in the football economy. Please give us a follow and a subscribe and help us grow. And um, look forward to doing this again very soon. Thank you so much, Bilal. Just to summarize, the core of this agenda story was to actually discuss the, you know, the Glazer stalling, potential stalling, why the stalling. And there is a final ruling of the AT team euro super league in europa this taking place and a verdict this coming thursday well is this the the um event that the glaze has been waiting for we will see we will see anyway thank you guys for tuning in big up for bilal yogi and stay beautiful people be nice to each other on the socials and merry merry christmas thank you for watching it's been mick ruby and bilal yogi talking football economy thank you Bye for now. Thank you so much for stopping by and watching MUFC Realist TV. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on the socials.